Chapter 1 Sunday, July 11, SEP, TH, slash SEP, 1852. I am so thankful we have found the place where we will settle. We hope to make the journey back by mid-October. Buildings must go up in a hurry, but I will probably be teaching the children who are on this journey with us. It will be a good way for me to support my unborn child. The dream was for Adam to ranch out here, and we'd build a real home where we could watch our children grow up. I miss Adam so much, but I think I miss the lost dream even more. While we're camped here in Clover Creek, my future home, I will be helping Mr. Henderson and his children. Mrs. Henderson was the first fatality of our journey, and now he's got a badly sprained ankle. His children will still need to eat, so I will offer to take over his campfire. He may not want or need the help, but his children look as if they haven't had a decent meal since their mother died. If I do nothing else, I can rectify that. After our church services, Katie Bedwell and I will make pies, and if Katie is willing, I will take a pie to Mr. Henderson and offer to do what I can. I hope he's still able to drive, because I don't think the captains would be willing to stop for him. When someone dies in the company, we bury them right on the trail, and then the wagons roll over their burial site, in hopes they'll pack the dirt enough and disguise the scent, and the wolves won't dig them up. I can't imagine a group of people who does that would stop for a sprained ankle. I often hear wolves at night. I didn't before Adam died, because I knew he would protect me from anything, but now that he's passed, it's all I hear while I try to sleep. Of course, I'm so tired from being pregnant and walking 20 miles a day that I'm thankfully able to sleep each night. I do feel as if God is watching over me. We'll leave early tomorrow morning to continue our journey toward Oregon City. I wish we could just stay here and claim the land the way our ancestors did here in America, but I know that's not possible. The government needs us to file a document saying that we are going to homestead the land. Or in my case, I will homestead the land. Adam is no longer with me, no matter how many times I expect him to just walk toward me at the end of the day. I must send a letter to my mother when we go through a town or fort again. I've written to tell her of Adam's death, but I haven't gotten to a place where I can mail it to her yet. I will do that at the first possible occasion. After Jane Davies finished making pies with Katie Bedwell that afternoon, Jane carried one of the pies to the Henderson family. They occasionally took meals with Margaret and her family, but they didn't have a great deal of money and now that Mr. Henderson couldn't hunt to pay for his portion of the meal, it would be better if someone made the Henderson family their personal project. Jane was certain it would help her to keep going as well. It was hard to know she was having a fatherless baby in a matter of months. Jane's long dark hair was pulled into a bun at the back of her neck. She could feel some tendrils escaping both onto her forehead and at the nape of her neck. She was going to have to let out her yellow, good dress soon as her burgeoning belly outgrew it. When Jane reached the Hendersons' camp, she spotted Mr. Henderson on the ground, looking defeated. His hair was a little longer than it should be, and she could tell he hadn't shaven his blonde beard in quite some time. Jane understood completely. They'd already come so many miles from home, and it was too late to turn back. But he was hurt his children were hungry, and his wife had passed months before. Excuse me, Mr. Henderson, Jane said softly. Katie Bedwell and I baked pies today, and I thought perhaps you and your family would enjoy one. Mr. Henderson looked up at Mrs. Davies in surprise. He didn't think they'd ever spoken. That would be most welcome, Mrs. Davies. How are you doing without Adam? He and I were on watch together several times. He was a good man. Jane smiled and took a deep breath. I'm plodding along like everyone else is. The babe she carried was all that kept her going, but it would be indelicate to mention her condition to a man she was unrelated to. I understand. When I lost my wife, I was certain the earth would open up and swallow me whole. I must keep going for my children, he said, grimacing at his foot the doctor had wrapped to stabilize. Yes, you must. 
Who will drive your wagon now that you're no longer able? He laughed softly. I'll keep driving my wagon. I just wish I had someone cooking for my youngsters. I seem to only be able to cook beans, and they are getting mighty tired of beans. Jane smiled. That's part of the reason I came to talk to you. It's hard for me to just keep pushing on without Adam, but if I could be allowed to cook for you and the children, at least until you're better if not for the entire trip, I think I'd have a reason to get up each morning that has nothing to do with our final destination. Mr. Henderson closed his eyes for a moment. You're an answer to prayers. We would welcome your help. I can't pay you, but I'll help build you a house once we're settled. That would be more than enough payment. I'll make sure the children keep up as well. I was a schoolteacher back in Wisconsin, and I would dearly love to help with them. I would be forever thankful for your help if you really don't mind. Not at all. As I said, it'll be good for me. Jane looked at the small campfire. May I use your food and some of my own to prepare meals? Absolutely. I don't suppose you're willing to start cooking for us tonight? My little ones have only had berries to eat so far today. Jane's eyes widened. She hadn't realized it was quite as bad as it was. I'll start now. I have some venison the hunters brought in last night. Perhaps I could make a meal from that and some rice? He nodded. That would be wonderful. Anything to fill us up. We'd be happy with Johnny Cakes for supper. Why don't I do Johnny Cakes now? It's late for the noon meal, but that's no reason to let your children go hungry. I'll make them now, and I'll do the venison meal around supper time. Some of the other women have made certain that I get a share of whatever meat is shot. It won't be a lot once we stretch it, but it'll be better than nothing. I would be obliged. Thank you for your generosity. Jane had a new spark in her step as she headed back toward Katie's camp. She was certain she could talk the other woman out of another small portion of meat to feed the Henderson family. As soon as she mentioned the children hadn't eaten yet that day, Katie cut off a large chunk of meat, and then she offered to come help cook. I'm not needed at the moment. Jane shook her head. No, I can do it. Thanks for reminding me how good it feels to help others, even when you feel like you want to die yourself. Katie sighed. This terrible journey has done it to us all. I just pray life really is better when we get settled. Jane took the venison over to the Henderson camp and then started digging through the back of their wagon for cornmeal. She found a jug of honey as well as the cornmeal, so pulled that out as well, thinking the children may enjoy the honey on their Johnny cakes. Mr. Henderson watched her as she cooked, as if he was trying to memorize everything she did. I never much cared about what happened in the kitchen as long as what was going on ended in a delicious meal for me. I should have learned from Judy. You had no way of knowing this would happen. The trail is hard, but I think the end is worth it. Having all that free land. What do you plan to do with your free land, Mr. Henderson? Jane asked. The original plan was to build a small hotel, where Judy would cook for the guests. Now I think the plan is to be a farmer or rancher. I didn't really bring enough livestock to be a rancher though. Perhaps there will be a place I can get some. I did bring three female oxen and a male. I'm not sure I can base an entire herd on that, though. Jane frowned. Do you want to be a farmer? He shrugged. My father is a farmer back in Kentucky. I always thought I'd follow in his footsteps, but Judy had grand ideas. You could still start a small hotel if you had someone helping you, couldn't you? Mr. Henderson sighed. Well, sure, but who would want to cook for me? Even ask my children how bad my beans always turn out. It may be something I'm interested in. I thought I was coming west to be a ranch wife, and we do have plenty of livestock just no man to build a house and build fences. I could also be persuaded to not teach all day and cook for you instead. That would make it easier to take care of my baby. 
He frowned for a moment, and then his eyes widened. A baby, huh? That's going to be hard with no man to support you. Trust me, she said. I'm well aware. I wanted to give up, but now I know there's a new life, I can't do that. She finished mixing the batter and carefully poured four small circles onto the skillet. I think you and I should join forces, he finally said after a long period of silence. Let's see how well we work together for a week or two and make some plans after that. She nodded. That would be nice. Truthfully, though, she knew she could be a teacher if all else failed. His children had been playing down by the creek with the others in the group, and as they walked into the circle of wagons, they spotted Jane cooking over their campfire. The oldest, David, started running, with the other two following closely behind. When David reached the fire, he stopped running. Are you making food for us, Mrs. Davies? I'm making Johnny cakes. I'm going to cook for your family at least until your pa can walk again. Jane grinned at the boy before carefully flipping each of the Johnny cakes. David clapped, turning to his sisters who had arrived shortly after he did. Mrs. Davies is going to cook for us while Pa is hurt. We need to hurt his other foot. Jane laughed. Now don't go hurting your Pa. I will cook for you as long as you need me to. Forever, David said adamantly folding his arms across his chest as if he was a young king and his word was law. The two younger children, both girls, copied his stance, looking at her curiously. I guess I'm cooking forever then. Jane grinned at the three. Wash up. I'll have Johnny cakes ready in a few minutes, and you're going to want to eat them while they're hot. The three hurried off to wash their hands with big brother David helping the smaller children. They're very well-mannered, Jane said. Mr. Henderson nodded. They're good children. Judy did a good job with them. I'm sure some of their manners came from you. He shook his head. I worked seven days a week back in Kentucky. There was no chance at all for me to teach them anything. They were usually asleep before I came in at the end of the day and were still sleeping when I left. That's why we wanted to start a business together. The children could help in small ways, but we'd always be together. Doesn't that sound lovely? Jane nodded. She understood having dreams washed away with a fickle turn of the river. That's how it had been for so many families on their journey. No more needed to be said as she fixed four plates, realizing there was no butter, so she ran back to her own wagon and brought the treat. The children were already eating the food with no honey or butter. Let me finish fixing them, and they'll taste better. David spoke with his mouth completely full, just after she'd complimented his manners. Scood. Mr. Henderson sighed. Don't talk with your mouth full. You know better. David nodded, waiting until he'd chewed the food in his mouth, before making his apology. I'm sorry. Mr. Henderson fell on his food as quickly as the children had. This is delicious, Mrs. Davies. Thank you so much for making us a meal when you had just eaten. Jane put some water on the fire to wash the dishes. You were all hungry, I see. I'm going to my wagon to sleep under it for an hour, and then I'll start on supper. I have an idea for something that will taste good to all of us. After lunch, the two little girls snuggled up together on the ground and slept. Mr. Henderson watched the children for a moment, before watching Mrs. Davies leave to return to her wagon. He was so thankful she had decided to help them. Perhaps she was right and having someone else to do for would help her stop thinking about the man she'd lost. He hoped so anyway. He had an idea that he'd talk to her about as soon as he knew how well they worked together. On a journey such as this one, you could learn a great deal about someone very quickly. He leaned back against the rock he was using to sit against, his mind going quickly. It would be harder for her because she'd just lost her husband, while Judy had died their first week out. 
If he'd had anything to go home to, he'd have gone home with his tail between his legs. Unfortunately, he'd sold all their belongings. They'd purchased the wagon and oxen, but he'd kept aside a good amount of money to help build his hotel. Perhaps he could make his wife's dream come true after all. Chapter 2 Sunday, July 11, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852 God is watching over my family. I had just about given up on God and everything else, but a recent widow of our company brought me a pie today and proceeded to offer to cook for us. I could afford to pay Mrs. Pruitt to cook for us, but then I wouldn't have the money I need to build the hotel Judy fantasized about. I have to keep her dream since I couldn't keep her. I may even name the hotel after her, but I haven't decided that yet. Mrs. Davies has said she'll cook for us as long as I need the help, and I'll still be able to drive, even with this ankle of mine, so the children will be fed well and looked after. I'm thankful for her offer as I had just decided to ask Mrs. Pruitt to make our meals, and I didn't want to dip into our hotel fund. Perhaps that would have been the right thing to do, but I like the idea of being able to see to my family. I'm sure it's just pride speaking, but I can't shirk away from that any better than I can shed my skin and climb into another's. The area where we are camped is beautiful. I've been told we'll stay over through tomorrow, so the men have time to hunt. The hunting and berry picking are better here than we've seen. It's truly a remarkable little place. I know I would like to settle my family here, but I'm not sure we'll make it all the way back here. It's been so hard on our family. What most of the company doesn't know is that my Judy was expecting when she died. I lost two people with her death. Not just one. I miss my wife with everything inside me, and I pray that I will be able to move on without the debilitating grief soon. I know that is why I injured myself. My mind wasn't on what I was doing. I was thinking about Judy. But since I'm constantly in prayer, I know God will help me through this time. Just as he sent one of his angels to us in the form of Mrs. Davies. After a short nap, from which Jane woke with a sense of purpose for the first time in a long while, she got up and took the ingredients needed to make the supper she had in mind at the Henderson's camp. She collected rice, flour, seasoning, and the venison and walked over, stoking the fire that was still there. Before doing anything else, she chopped the venison into tiny pieces that even the littlest of the Henderson family could eat. She knew three-year-old Alice from the daily walks, and she was certain the child wouldn't wait while anyone chopped up her food into manageable bites. She hadn't fed the family much for their noon meal because she felt they should all eat a hearty meal tonight, and they would have meat, which would help all of them. Jane missed having meat with supper every night, but she was certain the children needed a change from the beans they so hated a great deal more than she did. They'd all have meat that night. And judging by the deer, elk, and bear hanging from the trees, they'd have dried meat for some time to come. Jane went to the creek to collect water for their supper, and she coated the venison in flour before putting it into the pot she'd brought from her own supplies and browning it all, flipping it when necessary. When the meat was almost finished, she put the rice on the fire in the big pot the other family had before she added water to the venison to make a thick gravy that would taste good over the rice. She didn't realize Mr. Henderson was watching her until he spoke. Why add water to the meat, he asked. I'm making a gravy for the venison. It'll be far more appetizing over the rice that way. She frowned. I should make a vegetable to go with it. He shook his head. The children won't eat them. They're going to be very happy with real food for a change. I'm happy to make something. There should be enough for the noon meal tomorrow as well. I always say, if it's good once, it's good a second time. He smiled. Thank you for your kindness toward me and my children. I'd about given up on God because my prayers seemed to be ignored. Jane took a deep breath. Never give up on our Heavenly Father. He's the one who is giving us the strength to move a little further every day. 
Mr. Henderson nodded at her but said nothing. She wasn't sure if he was agreeing with her or simply placating her, and at that moment, she didn't care. She'd said her piece. Glancing under the wagon, she could tell that all three children were off playing again. All of the children were enjoying playing in the creek. It wasn't a hot day, but it was hot enough that the water would feel wonderful. The venison and gravy were completely finished, and the rice was almost done when the children came back to camp. All three looked like they'd been in the creek with all their clothes on, but Jane didn't say a word. It wasn't her place. David, the oldest, asked, What are you making, Mrs. Davies? It sure does smell good. Jane smiled. I'm making venison in a gravy to put over the rice. I think it will be delicious, though I've never cooked anything like it before. You'll have to tell me if it's good or not so I can decide if I'll ever make it again. Alice pulled two fingers out of her mouth as she spoke for all of them. No beans. Jane laughed. No beans tonight. Hattie, the middle child, shook her head. No beans ever. I can't make that promise. We don't know how long our other food will stay good. I'll try not to make a lot of beans, though. Does that make you feel better? All three children nodded. When Jane started to fill plates for all of them, little Alice was practically dancing. She was so excited to get food that wasn't beans, and it was obvious to all of them. For a moment, Jane considered taking her own food back to her camp to eat in solitude, but she knew it would be better for her to stay with the Hendersons. It was strange that she liked to be alone so much, even though she knew it was better for her to be with other people. While they ate, Mr. Henderson talked to the children about what they'd done that day. I picked some berries while the little kids were sleeping, and then we all played in the creek once they were awake, David said. I took a nap. Alice said. Hattie nodded. I napped and played. Jane was surprised at Mr. Henderson's next words. What about you, Mrs. Davies? What did you do today? I went to the church service and then Mrs. Bedwell and I made several pies with the berries we picked yesterday. I brought your family a pie, fixed the noon meal, slept for a while, and came back here to fix supper. It was a normal non-traveling day. Has anyone said for certain if we're moving on tomorrow or spending another day hunting and gathering berries and firewood? It's nice to have some firewood again. It was better to burn firewood than buffalo chips, though they'd burned their share of the chips. Jane shrugged. I haven't talked to anyone since the noon meal, but I'll go ask around. Perhaps the children and I can pick some more berries this evening, and we can make another pie. David smiled. Can we have pie for dessert? Jane smiled. If it's all right with your father, I'll slice it up. All three children looked at their father. Would that be all right, Pa? David asked. Mr. Henderson nodded. You're all going to be spoiled by Mrs. Davies if she keeps making pies. Seeing that the children had cleaned their plates and wanting to save as much of the meal as they could for the following day, Jane carefully removed the pie from the back of the wagon where she'd put it earlier and cut it into eight pieces. Then she carefully cut one of the pieces into two pieces giving the girls the half-pieces. The children ate their pie greedily while Mr. Henderson savored every bite. Let me know what you find out about when we move on, he said once he'd finished, and set his fork on the edge of his plate. Thank you for our fine supper, Mrs. Davies. We're very appreciative. I was happy to do it, Jane responded. As soon as I finish the dishes, I'll find out when we leave and decide if I can wait until tomorrow to pick berries or if I should go ahead and do it tonight. Mr. Henderson nodded, reaching for the crutches Dr. Bentley had given him to use. Thankfully, he was the only one who needed them at the moment. Jane watched him struggle, but didn't offer to help. A man had his pride, after all. After finishing the dishes, Jane walked toward the Bedwell's camp to ask about whether they would leave in the morning or wait a day. 
she spotted Katie and smiled. It was nice to have a true friend on a journey like this. Katie, she called out as she approached the camp. Katie smiled, waving to her. I saw you cooking for the Hendersons. I think it's good you have someone to care for. Jane nodded. I believe it is. Tell me, did the captains decide to leave in the morning, or wait until Tuesday? The decision was made to move in the morning, but we'll stop an hour early so we can hunt and get more berries. This part of the country is much cooler, so we can start early, take a long noon break and continue our walk in the early evening when it's cooler again. During our break, we can hunt and collect fruit that we see. George said the next stop is only about 30 miles away, and we'll take two days to do it. That way we can stop and replenish supplies along the way. There's some sort of strange springs there from what he said. There'll be a camping point halfway for people who want to stop along the way like we are. That'll be nice. All right. I promised Mr. Henderson I'd let him know as soon as I found out, but he's not quite back to camp yet. Would you like me to wipe the dishes while I wait for him to return? Katie shook her head. No need. I can handle them. You're going to want to get as many berries as you can before we leave in the morning. There's another patch past where we were picking them last night. That will be the best place to go, I think. Just make sure you leave some for the other companies. I will. I wish we had time to dry the berries before moving on. Jane started back to the Henderson's camp as she saw Mr. Henderson drop the crutches and sit down beside the rock he'd been using to lean against. Thanks for the information, and I'll talk to you later, she called over her shoulder as she headed away. Mr. Henderson was fussing with the bandage on his ankle. Do you need some help with that? Jane asked. I could try to do it or run and fetch the doctor for you. No, thank you. I need to learn to see to it myself. When he removed the bandage, she could see swelling and bruising on all sides of the ankle, and her heart immediately went out to him. That's a really bad sprain, she said. I could bring some of the cold water from the creek to soak it in. He shook his head. I don't think I need that. Doc gave me a little laudanum if I need it, but so far, I've managed to avoid it. Jane shuddered. My father took that when he broke his back. He acted like a crazy man for three weeks before he finally started healing. I don't think you should take it. She'd rather he used whiskey for the pain, and she was no believer in alcohol for anything. Mr. Henderson nodded. I don't plan to. But I have it if I need it. Is there any other way I can help tonight? I want to get some berries picked before it's dark. There's a basket in the very back of my wagon. Take my children and race them. That's how Judy got them to do their chores quickly, and it always worked. I will do that. Are they down by the creek? He chuckled. By it or in it. I don't think they really know the difference right now. None of the children do. I'll get them to help. I'll use my schoolmarm voice if I have to. Good. Collect lots so we can have more pies. Jane was smiling as she headed toward her wagon, surprised she still remembered how. Her grieving had completely taken her over for so long that it was hard for her to believe there was an entire spectrum of emotions she'd forgotten. She got her berry basket from the back and went in search of the Henderson children. Following the sounds of laughter down to the creek, she stood at the edge, shielding her eyes from the sun. There were at least twenty children in the creek, most of whom she knew by name. She watched them frolic for a moment before calling out, David, Hattie, and Alice? I need you to come out and pick berries with me. Though the children looked saddened, they immediately got out of the water, dripping their way toward her. David took the basket from her and she realized then the children hadn't even removed their shoes. You can't wear shoes in the creek. David shrugged. The water's cold, and we didn't want our toes to get cold. 
Jane hid the laugh that threatened to come out. You'll ruin your shoes that way. Come on. I know where a good patch is, and we can make another pie if we get enough berries. The children looked excited as soon as she said the word that motivated them beyond all others, pie. The four of them went and collected berries as quickly as they could. Remember to only get the ripe ones. We want there to be more berries for the next company who comes through here. David nodded. I'll make sure the girls do it right. We won't pick the berries that should be left behind for others. Watching the boy with his little sisters, Jane felt her heart ache for him. He'd had to grow up much too quickly due to his mother's death. The children still had sad looks on their faces most of the time, but there they were, picking berries as if their next meal depended on it. Sometimes she wondered if this death march as Mrs. Mitchell called it was worth the free land. She knew Adam had considered it the most important journey in the world. Had he been right? Maybe someday she'd know the answer to that, but it wouldn't be until they'd settled in on that new land. She just hoped it would be soon. Once the girls were settled on the back of the wagon with their bowls of food, she tracked down David and handed his to him. It's cold but should still taste good. Thank you, Mrs. Davies. Taking the rest of the food for herself, Jane walked as she ate. The other women were all doing the same. Mary fell into step beside Jane, chatting with her. I'm glad you're taking on the Hendersons, Mary said. We were talking after church Sunday about who could feed them until Mr. Henderson could walk again, and when I looked up, you were there helping out. Thank you. It helped me a lot when Mrs. Bedwell took me under her wing and fed me after Adam's death. There were a few days I wasn't sure how I was going to be able to keep going. Mary nodded. That's happening more than it should in our little camp. I wish I had words of wisdom but what can you say to make someone feel better after something so awful? Jane nodded, taking another bite of her meal. I was going to be a rancher's wife once we reached Oregon. Now I'll have to go back to being a schoolmarm, and someone else will have to see to my baby all day. It doesn't seem right. No, it doesn't. What can I do to help you? Mary asked. Nothing. Doing for others makes me feel better than anything anyone could do for me. I had no idea it would make me feel as good as it has. Mary smiled, nodding. That's how I am as well. If I can do something for someone else, I can keep going. If I'm completely on my own, there's no way I can. Jane sighed. Why are women made this way? No idea. Remember, if you need something or even just need a little help with the Hendersons, I'm here, and I'll help in any way I can. I think that's my favorite part about walking the trail. We have made connections with each other, and when we all settle together, it will just feel like we're continuing this journey, with friends and family. I'm your sister, Mary said with a wink. Now I need to run back and see if my ma needs help with any of the little ones. I promised when I married Bob that I would be certain to help out just as much as I did before the wedding. We take supper with my family every night, and I help with the cooking. It's better that way. Jane nodded, as Mary slowed down so her mother could catch up with her. As Jane walked, she realized that for the first time, she really did feel as if she was part of a big family on the trail. Everyone looked out for her, and now she was looking out for others. Life seemed to come full circle often, and this circle was a good one. David caught up with Jane then and gave her his empty bowl. It was delicious, Mrs. Davies. Do you want me to put my dishes and yours in the back of the wagon by the girls? That would be wonderful. Are you going to nap today? David scoffed. I'm seven. Naps are for babies. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Of course, you won't nap. She hid a grin as the boy hurried ahead and found their wagon and put the dishes into it. She held back for a moment, 
and fell into step with Mrs. Cauldron, a lovely woman with twin boys who were absolute menaces. How are you doing today, Mrs. Cauldron? Oh, doing well. I had to fish the boys out of the creek this morning, but other than that, everything is good. I'm sure the boys will end up being well-behaved, won't they? Jane couldn't hold back a laugh. As a school marm, I've noticed that the boys who cause the most trouble when they're little, tend to be the hardest workers later in life. They just have too much energy, and they put it into mischief when they're little, but as they grow, they find much better uses for all that energy. Why, I wouldn't be surprised if one of your boys became a minister. Mrs. Cauldron laughed, shaking her head. That's not going to happen. How could it? They can't sit still long enough to memorize one scripture, let alone learning all they needed to know to preach God's word. You may be surprised, Jane said softly. She loved that Mrs. Cauldron didn't have romantic notions about her boys. She didn't expect them to act perfectly. She knew who they were. Have you seen my sister this afternoon? Mrs. Cauldron asked. I hope she's not sitting in the back of her wagon reading again. She needs to get to know people. I saw her riding with the doc earlier. They seem to be having an in-depth discussion about something. Of course. The doc is training Betty to be a nurse for him. She loves learning, so she rides with him, and he teaches her often. And she's reading all his medical books. Sounds like she's going to be doing a lot of good. I'm glad she's not afraid to learn all that stuff. I think I would be. Mrs. Cauldron shook her head. Not Betty. If there's something to be learned, she's the first to say she wants to learn it. I always thought she'd be a good doctor, but who would go see a woman doctor? The notion is ridiculous. But Betty could do it if she put her mind to it. Jane smiled. It's nice to know we have a woman of her intelligence along. I wouldn't mind learning from her. We just have to convince her she can teach others, even though she's shy. Chapter 4 Monday, July 12, Sup, th, slash Sup, 1852 We left Clover Creek this morning and headed toward the carbonated water springs that are promised 30 miles up the trail. Thank heavens for Mrs. Davies, who made us breakfast and then fed us all the noon meal while we continued on. When we reached the 15 miles the captains scheduled for today, we were atop a summit of some sort, and we made our camp here. The hills were steep, but they were nothing compared to Big Hill where I hurt my ankle. Instead, they were a steady incline, but not so sharp. We'll go down the other side tomorrow, and I'm not certain how ready I am to go down a steep hill again. Thankfully, I won't need to worry about the children, because along with cooking for us, Mrs. Davies seems to have taken over the supervision of the children as well. For supper, we had some of the meat that was hunted at Clover Creek, along with potatoes and a rich gravy. I find Mrs. Davies is a wonderful cook, perhaps only true because I spent so long trying to eat my own cooking and listening to my children complain about everything I made. We'll reach Soda Springs Complex tomorrow, where there will be more food for us to purchase. I don't mind buying food now, but there is someone who can cook it properly and not burn it the way I do. I do think I need to suggest a more permanent arrangement to Mrs. Davies, but I'll wait the week out like I initially thought. You can learn a great deal about someone in the span of a week. After supper that evening, all the men who were able set out with their rifles, hoping to get more bears, elk, deer, and buffalo. On the old map Adam had, all were indicated to be good hunting there. Hopefully, they'd have enough dried meat to last them all the way to Oregon City and back by the time they left the area. Jane sat with Mr. Henderson and his children as the men went out to hunt. She saw women disappear with their berry baskets, so she suggested she take the children. Would it be all right if I took the children berry picking? she asked softly. I think it helps the little ones to appreciate their meals when they take part in harvesting them. Mr. Henderson nodded. That would be very nice, if you don't mind. 
I'm sure you can pick more on your own. I could. But then the children wouldn't learn. He waved his hand as if dismissing her. Jane took the basket from the back of the Henderson's wagon and hurried to her own for her basket, and then she went in search of the children, who were busy collecting kindling and small branches for their fires as they moved along. Put your wood near the campfire, but not so close it could catch fire, and then come berry picking with me. The more berries we collect, the more pies we'll have on our journey. All three children ran back to camp and came to her. David, carry the basket. Alice and Hattie, pick as many ripe berries as you can. We'll have a race to see if I can do more than you three. David let out an excited whoop. We're going to win. Jane just laughed, pleased that the children were ready to try to beat her. They'd get more berries that way. She led the children out past the other women, and the four of them picked huckleberries. The berries were tiny, and it would take a great deal to make a pie, but Jane didn't mind. The children were learning the importance of working to help the family, and she was proud of them. When both baskets were mostly full, Jane declared a tie, and they hurried back to camp to show off their berries. Katie met Jane when she was almost back to the Henderson's camp. What berries did you find? I found a grove of raspberries. Some were ripe, but most weren't. I'd happily trade half of my raspberries for some huckleberries. Jane smiled, nodding emphatically. That sounds wonderful. The children hurried on back to camp, while Jane and Katie exchanged berries so they'd each have some of both varieties. When Jane returned to the Henderson's camp, Mr. Henderson was on his feet without his crutches. He wobbled a bit, and Jane hurried to his side to keep him from falling. Are you supposed to be on that foot yet? she asked, giving him her stern schoolteacher look. He shrugged. Doc said it would be fine if it didn't hurt me. And is it hurting you? More than I care to admit. He sighed. I think I'm going to be using crutches for a few days yet. I don't think that's a problem. You're driving every day and I can help with the children. I know. I just feel like I'm not doing my part, and that's part of what we all agreed to before we left independence. Yes, it is, Jane said. But everyone has been sick or injured along the way, or even lost family members. We're moving as a group to help one another. You're not slowing anyone down, so I would think all is good. That's probably true. I have to ask that you take some of the money I have saved for the hotel and go get some fresh food tomorrow when we get to Soda Springs Complex. Would you mind? I'd be happy to. Do you know what you want me to get? Or should I use my own judgment? Mr. Henderson pursed his lips. Use your judgment. I'll give you ten dollars, and you buy as much as you can. I think I'm low on coffee. I have coffee. I'll look and see if it's worth spending money on more. He frowned. You don't mind sharing? She shook her head. Not at all. I'm more of a tea drinker than a coffee drinker. The coffee was for Adam. Which do you have your children drink? My wife had them on tea only, but since I've taken over, they've been drinking coffee. I can't be bothered to make both. I'll switch them back to tea. I think that's easier for small children to drink. Jane still couldn't drink coffee easily. To her, it was a bitter grown-up drink for people other than herself. Tea was her favorite. I've swapped some of the huckleberries we picked this evening for raspberries. I hope you like raspberries because I think I'm making raspberry pancakes in the morning. He grinned. That sounds so much better than Johnny Cakes. I shouldn't complain because they are filling and keep me going, but they're not my favorite breakfast. I'll try to keep that in mind. I wish I'd been smart enough to bring some chickens along so I could have fresh eggs along the way. They're so hard to keep corralled though. I wouldn't have chickens along for anything. I can see the logic in that. She still wished she had chickens though. 
It would be nice to start a hen house with fresh eggs every morning and pullets for their meals. Will you serve what we had left from supper for the noon meal again tomorrow? She nodded. It seems the easiest way to do things. We have only fifteen miles to go tomorrow, but this hill looks awfully steep. It is. That's all right, though. We'll make it down the hill and to the next town. I'm excited to see the spring so many have talked about. I think the children will enjoy them. Is it just one spring or are there multiple springs? She asked, not having done the kind of research Mr. Henderson or her late husband had done on the trail. There are many. Indian lore says they have healing properties. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I'm willing to try anything. Maybe if I soak my foot in one of the springs, I'll be able to walk more easily. That sounds interesting. Do you know if the springs are hot or cold? That information has not drifted my way. I do know there are hot springs along the way, but I have no idea where they'll be. I suppose it will be fun to find out in the morning. Jane hid a yawn behind her hand. I'm going to use a bit of drinking water to wash our berries, and then I'm going to head to my wagon for sleep. I can't get used to sleeping out in the open like so many do. I want to be under my wagon where I feel safe. I can understand that. Before I hurt myself, I put up a tent for the children every night, but now the girls sleep inside the wagon, and David and I sleep under it. He likes it a lot. Feels like he's a man sleeping under the wagon. She smiled. I can understand that perfectly. Getting to her feet, she picked up the two baskets and took a small amount of their drinking water. After washing the berries, she put them into the back of the wagon and headed to her own makeshift home. There was no point in changing clothes, as she would wear the same dress the following day. Instead, she pulled out her blanket and curled up under the wagon. She would have liked to sleep under the stars, but it didn't feel safe with Indians and bears running around. She was up early the following morning, as was her practice. She would have liked to sleep until well past noon, but the opportunity hadn't presented itself in a good long while. She found the fixings for pancakes in the back of her wagon, as well as coffee, and she headed over to the Henderson's camp where she started breakfast. By the time the whistle sounded to wake them all, Jane had the fire going, and the smell of bacon permeated the air. David woke up, and the first thing he said was, Bacon. Pa, she's making bacon. Jane grinned to herself at the enthusiasm in the boy's voice. It was hard not to have all the comforts of home, but there was a bit of bacon that didn't have to have the mold trimmed from it. Hopefully, bacon would be one of those foods she could buy in Soda Springs Complex. After a quick breakfast and an even quicker cleanup, they were on their way, well before the time they usually started. The captains had decided not to spend more than a night in the town coming up, so everyone would need to get supplies when they arrived that evening, which meant starting early and moving quickly down the road. Not that they could really move quickly. The oxen had one speed, slow. They would just take no noon break again. Thankfully she'd made enough to last the family until they reached the little town ahead. The company had passed up many of the forts and towns along the way, hoping to be able to make good enough time to be settled in before winter. This time, there were too many people out of food, and they had no choice. But still, they'd only take a few hours to replenish their supplies before they moved on toward Oregon City. The day's pace was difficult, at least at first as they had to descend the hill, and each person was careful where each step landed. It would be an easier trek if there weren't so many mountains between Independence and Oregon City, she thought for the fiftieth time that week. It seemed like the mountains had crept up on them and they were forced to learn to climb and descend hills whether they were ready for them or not. No one was hurt during the descension, which Jane felt was a minor miracle in and of itself. And then they headed up and down and around many more hills before they reached their destination. After setting up camp for the evening, Jane went to Mr. Henderson to see what he would have her do. 
He gave her ten dollars in coins, and she went to find food to sustain her and his little family for the next two and a half months. It felt like her journey should be over because she'd found her future home, but the journey to Oregon City and back wasn't something they could ignore or skip if they wanted to legally own their land in Clover Creek. Jane went off to trade with the traders and the few Indians that were camped there, waiting for emigrants such as themselves. She was able to purchase a great deal of potatoes, flour, and more bacon. She was thankful the old bacon could be thrown away. After taking the goods back to camp and wishing she'd brought a young man to carry her purchases for her, she fixed their supper, thankful to have been one of the first of the women shopping there. Do you need more ammunition? she asked Mr. Henderson. He shook his head. I bought three times what we were told to buy. I assume you still have some of Adam's ammunition? Jane nodded. I've never personally traded with an Indian before, but they were the ones to sell me the bacon and potatoes. Should I get more cornmeal? Suddenly she was second-guessing herself, wondering what the best things she could have purchased were. I still have more than two dollars. I think more cornmeal would be good. I prefer wheat flour, but the cornmeal lasts longer, and we should be able to eat all the way to Oregon City on it. We can get more provisions there, of course. Oh, good. I'll run and fetch some cornmeal. This time, she went to Katie and asked for her son Stanley's help to bring her purchases back to camp. He was more than willing to help, and that pleased her. The huge sack of cornmeal was just what they needed, and she instructed Stanley to put it into the back of her wagon, and not that of the Hendersons. It would be better that way, because she wasn't taking up space that his girls would sleep in. Stanley offered to empty their drinking water and add new to their barrels, and she was very thankful, but the captains had warned them that drinking too much of the carbonated water would make them sick. They couldn't let the oxen have much of it either. Then she took the hands of each of the Henderson girls, and they went and looked at the spring. It looked like someone had carbonated the water artificially and then pumped it into the ground. She couldn't wait to write in her journal about the marvel she'd seen there on the edge of the trail. It was truly a sight to see. Chapter 5 Tuesday, July 13, SUP, TH, SLASH SUP, 1852. We are camped in the most wondrous place I have ever been. There are many springs full of carbonated water here, including one called Beer Springs. They truly seem as if someone has artificially carbonated water and poured it into the ground to be used by all. Most of the springs are cold, but one spring is hot, and many of the women are doing their laundry there even though it was done on Sunday. I am not quite so ambitious. We were able to buy some supplies here, and the Hendersons, and I will be set until we reach Oregon City. I must say, I will be very thankful when we finally reach and see that elephant. The Henderson children and I are becoming more comfortable with one another every day, and Mr. Henderson seems to enjoy my company as well as my cooking. Is it shameful to say I would like for him to ask me to marry him so I no longer have to worry so much about what will become of my child and me at the end of our journey? I do know we'll settle in Clover Creek, but will I have to teach school again? I know I can't homestead on my own. Not with an infant. But if I were to marry Mr. Henderson, whose first name I do not yet know, that worry would be taken off my shoulders. I would only agree to a marriage in name only. I could not have relations with a man other than my Adam. I believe I will die still loving him. I know it may seem impractical to many, but perhaps it will work. When you have a love as strong as mine with Adam, it changes your life and spoils you for other men. I am spoiled. Tomorrow, we will head further along the Bear River, which has been our compass since we left Clover Creek. I pray that there will be another body of water to travel along as the water makes the journey easier and less deadly. I should look at the map my Adam kept in his Bible. I will do that before I cook the morning meal. And then I will know if we will still travel along a river or if we will be on dry land the entire time. 
After closing her journal, Jane stuck her head into the back of her wagon to find her late husband's Bible with the map he'd tucked neatly inside. According to the map, they had another short period of following the Bear River, and then they would travel along the Portneuf River for a short while. After that, they would be on the banks of a large lake that didn't seem to be labeled on her map. She would find out when she arrived what the lake was called. Everyone would know before they arrived. That's how it was in their company. She was true to her word and made pancakes with raspberries for breakfast that morning. The children gobbled them up quickly, and Jane made a few more. They should be able to eat their fill in the morning when they were going to walk twenty miles or so. It was only right. Everyone had said the day would be an arduous one, with a huge summit they had to walk over, but they would end the day near some healing hot springs, and she loved the idea of taking a hot bath for free. She joined with Katie and Hannah for the day's trek, not at all surprised when the captains announced another day without a noon break. The days without a break were much harder for everyone involved, but it would make it so they had more time that evening with the hot springs available. The captain had said that the men would bathe while the women made their suppers, and then the women could bathe. It seemed strange to Jane, thinking about bathing with so many other women, but she wasn't going to complain. A hot bath. Who could ask for more? Jane made a supper of bacon, gravy, and biscuits. She knew it wasn't the healthiest thing to feed the family, but sometimes you made what you had, and she had plenty of flour and bacon. They could eat this meal every day for a week, and she would still feel like they had enough to make many more meals. She knew the children would enjoy the diversity of food other than beans. It would be impossible to avoid cooking the staple for the rest of their journey, but she would do her best not to overdo it. Mr. Henderson wasn't able to go down to the hot spring with the other men, as his ankle was still bothering him. Jane grinned when Pastor Scott and Mr. Pruitt approached the camp and made a chair with their hands, hauling Mr. Henderson off to the hot springs, with his loud protests ringing in her ears. After he returned, they had supper, and then she and the girls went down to the hot springs. Hattie and Alice each dipped a toe into the water, but they declared it too hot to bathe in. Jane had no qualms. She stripped down to her drawers and climbed into the hot pool along with the other women, who had all chosen to preserve their modesty in the same way. Mrs. Mitchell pulled out a bar of soap and washed her hair, then passed the bar around the hot pot. It was wonderful. All the women laughed and joked as they sank into the water, completely submerging themselves to get the suds from their hair. Jane smiled. This journey wouldn't be half so difficult if we could sink into one of these every night. Everyone agreed. Eventually, they each climbed from the hot pot and let themselves drip dry in the waning sunlight. I cannot think of a better way to end our day, Hannah said happily. It felt as if the babe was spinning around inside me. I think she liked the water too. She? Mary asked. Are you wishing a girl as a first child on the good pastor? Hannah nodded. I am. I'm not even ashamed of it. Laughter was heard all around the pool as the women donned their dresses over wet drawers to head back to the men. I wish we'd have time to do this again in the morning, Margaret said longingly. I'm always up before the whistle blows. I'm certain I'll be here before we leave, Jane said. Several of the women agreed to meet there the following morning. We do have to feed our children, though, Margaret said. We do. But I think we can bathe and then feed the children and the men. I suppose we should feed the men, Mrs. Mitchell, said to everyone's amusement. I cannot think of a lovelier way to finish the day or start the next. I wish I could settle where there was a hot pool right next to my house and I could go out and enjoy the waters whenever I felt like it, Penelope said. I would be the happiest woman alive. They all laughed as they headed back to camp. Jane was glad she'd taken the time to wash the supper dishes before she'd gone off to play in the water. It was best that everyone startled settling down for the night. 
Jane helped the little girls into the back of their wagon and made sure David was settled underneath before heading back to her own wagon. She did like helping the other family, but sometimes she was ready to be alone in her own camp at nighttime, and this was one of those times. She settled under her wagon, thinking about the wonderful day she'd just had, ending in such a perfect way. She felt energized to take on more of the trail, though she knew there were still months of travel ahead of her. Her legs didn't ache quite as much from all the walking as they had done before. Perhaps the springs were healing after all. She couldn't help but think about how much Adam would have loved the hot pots and this part of the journey. If only she hadn't lost him. Life would never be the same for her now that he was gone. Across camp, Matthew Henderson was thinking about what a good woman Mrs. Davies was and how good she'd been with his children. He couldn't keep waiting to ask her to be his bride. Some other man would notice how helpful she was and want her for his own wife. He decided then and there to talk to her the next day about it. It seemed quick, but he knew better than letting the grass grow under his feet. And his ankle was so much better after the hot springs, he could even walk with her a bit away from the camp to have their talk. The doc had said not to count on his ankle staying better, but he knew it was healed. God had given him two miracles that week. A healed ankle and Mrs. Davies. She had already made his life better. As usual, Jane woke early the following morning, and after a brief note in her journal, she rushed to the hot pots to see only Margaret Pruitt and Hannah Scott there. Where's everyone else? Jane asked as she stripped down to her drawers. Hannah grinned. Sleeping. It's hard to believe I once favored being awake late into the night. Margaret shook her head at her friend. Funny that she's learning to be a good little pastor's wife, isn't it? Jane grinned. I think she had it in her all the while. Hannah laughed. No, I didn't. I learned to fake it for Jed. After their frolic in the hot pot, they all returned to their own camps, and Jane gathered the ingredients she'd need for breakfast. She was surprised to hear the whistle blow when she was on her way to the Henderson's camp. Did she really spend a full hour in the hot pot? She quickly made pancakes, having vowed she would make them every morning for a while, as Mr. Henderson preferred them to Johnny Cakes. As soon as they were all fed and the breakfast dishes were washed, Mr. Henderson surprised Jane. Would you take a walk with me? Jane nodded. You can walk now? The hot pot did wonders for my ankle. Doc says it won't last long, but I refuse to believe him. Jane noted that he was still limping as they walked away from the pots to the other side of the trail. Have I done something to displease you? she asked. No, not at all. To the contrary, I wanted to ask you an important question. I know this is going to seem to be coming suddenly, but I'd like to ask you to be my wife, in name only, of course. I don't think either of us are ready to give up on our lost loves. I like how you are with my children, and I know you'd do better with a man to protect you, and we do like to eat in my family, he felt as if he was making a mess of things but he wasn't sure how one should propose to someone he barely knew. Jane had hoped this would happen. It really would be best for both of them. I will under one condition. What's that? he asked, frowning at her. You have to tell me what your first name is. I'm not one of those women who would refer to the man she was married to by his last name, whether the marriage was in name only or not. He laughed softly. It's Matthew. I can't believe you've helped me this much and you don't know my Christian name. I'm Jane, Matthew. And yes, I'll marry you, but it will have to be in name only. It hasn't been that long since I lost my Adam. I understand. More than anything I want someone I can expect to cook for my family and raise my children. You'll have that in me. You don't mind that I'm expecting? Not even a little bit. It means you were happy in your marriage. I would like to reconsider things after your babe is born. Perhaps then we can make the marriage a real one. Jane nodded. 
We can talk about that when the time comes. Would you like to marry this evening, after we have our supper? That would be acceptable. Should I keep my wagon? Or should we combine everything to make it easier on both of us? I believe we should combine. But that can wait until our day off, if you'd like. She shook her head. No, it's only Thursday. There's no need for my wagon to be driven for two more days. Tonight then. The other women will help? Yes, of course. I've helped them when they needed it. I feel like we're all a big family, and the other women are the sisters of my heart. He walked back toward camp with her keeping the pace beside him. You're limping much more heavily than you were. He sighed. I know. I should have listened to the doc. I do feel as if I can go on without the crutches, though. That's a good thing. Shall we tell the children? Yes, of course. Matthew hadn't thought of what it would be like to tell his youngsters that he was marrying again. He was sure they'd be happy because they'd have a permanent cook, but they sometimes surprised him. They told the children as soon as they got back to camp. David was the only one with something to say about it. Good. We need someone who can cook. Jane laughed. I'm glad to know my role within your family, she said, grinning at Matthew. Help me hitch up the oxen, David, Matthew said as he limped toward where the oxen were corralled. Yes, Pa. You walk better than you did, but you still don't walk very good. Very well, and you're right. The hot pot did a great job, but I don't think it was a job that will last long. I'll have to wait until it heals properly before I do anything too much. Jane was with the little girls, and Hattie looked at her shyly. Will you read stories to me before bed like my mama used to? Of course, I will. I love to read. Do you know how? Hattie shook her head while little Alice stood with two fingers in her mouth, watching the other two. I want to learn soon. I used to be a school teacher. How about we start learning to read? I'd like that. Alice obviously wasn't interested in learning to read, but she went to Jane and leaned against her, the first two fingers of her right hand in her mouth as usual. Jane knew Alice would be the one to rely on her the most. 